everybody, and welcome to episode 76 of the I Rock Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, also known as I Rock Knits everywhere on the internet. You can go over and follow me on Instagram, where I am currently putting up knitting tips for everyone on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. It's helping me to grow a bit of an advanced beginner audience. <laughs> but I also have some very experienced knitters chiming in that they like some of the tips that I'm doing. So thank you for that. I just recently reached 8,000 subscribers. I have been in the 7,000 subscribers for four years. Since we wrote the Minnesota 52 book, I have just been hoovering around. I lose followers, I gain followers. And you know, there's always that elusive 10,000 follower number that people that are in business want to reach so that they can get the automatic swipe up fr from Instagram. And that's just a magic number. I wish Instagram would give it to everyone, but they, are not willing to do that, so you have to have 10,000 subscribers. And just suddenly, in the last few weeks, my numbers have been growing and growing, and I think it has a lot to do with the knitting tips I'm posting. So that's been a lot of fun. We are getting rain. It's a little dark here today, but we are so thankful. My community, about a week and a half ago, went on a 100% watering ban. We have no water, which is such a rarity in Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, right? Um, it's just been crazy, um, but there have been, and our, so all of the lawns are dying, the flowers, um, you are able to water by hand, um, but no, you know, you can't have your sprinklers going. It, it's just been really sad to see people just let their flowers and their plants kind of wither because people also don't want to use water when you can. Um, it's just not really in the spirit of the program, right? To have watering restrictions and then continue to water. So we are so thankful that we're getting rain today. It, it's just been crazy in the county that I live in with um, how much water we were using. And the city finally just said, you can't continue to do this. Everyone's using so much more water. And so ugh, I don't think it's gonna rain for very long. It's kind of what you would call just a light rain um, I was really hoping a big thunderstorm would blow in this afternoon, but we'll take every drop we can get. So I have the lights on. Hopefully it's uh, bright enough. What am I wearing today? I'm wearing another Gudrun Shodin dress. Um, uh, we went to church this morning. Um, it is nice to be back in church and seeing some of those people. I know everyone who watches this is not a Christian, but that's how I was raised. And it is, um, it is my heart place. It is the place that um, I pray for people and I have lots of people in my life right now who need prayers. So it feels good to go that there and honor that. Um, and so I just didn't change. I just came home and quick put the dress the mannequins as we do every two weeks and prop them up on boxes. It's so it's so strange that I, I carry out these two boxes and prop my mannequins up on it every every couple weeks and then I take them down and then I prop them up. You'd think I could get some type of permanent solution for for displaying things behind me, but I'm at this high table and that's just what works for me. Um, but I did talk about this um, a couple podcasts ago too. Um, this is uh, organic cotton, uh, comes from Sweden. Um, she has all the colors, although she does some neutral palettes as well. Um, I bought several things. They wash up great. They're super easy to wear. Um, I have maybe two or three dre a dress and two tunics and a couple of shirts now, and I've been wearing them every time I leave the house, which isn't all that often, but whenever I leave the house, I throw one of these on. They're just soft and, and easy to wear, so I thought, I'm not going to put on a sweater this morning. It was still fairly warm here, and I have a few summer sweaters, but I just didn't feel like wearing one today. It was just easier to pull on a one-piece dress. I don't know. I just think house dresses are the easiest way to go, right? You just pull them on and put on some biker shorts underneath, and you're good to, you're good to go. Uh, let's do audiobooks this week. I have finished uh, three audiobooks, um, two pretty good and one not so great. Um, the best book I've read in the last couple months, I would say, The Lost and Found Bookshop by Susan Wiggs. So good. Oh my gosh, so good. Couldn't stop listening. That's the kind of book I was looking for. I started and stopped probably three different books on Libby in the last 
a couple weeks because I just couldn't find one. I was reading the description like, oh, okay, I'll try it. And I, I tried one and, and listened to, you know, a few chapters and I thought, I'm just not enjoying it. Why am I putting myself through this? This just hit all the sweet spots. So let me tell you a bit about it. Author Susan Wiggins explores the meaning of happiness, trust, and faith in oneself as she asks the question, if you had to start over, what would you do and who would you be? In the wake of a shocking tragedy, Natalie Harper inherits her mother's charming but financially strapped bookshop in, Ch in San Francisco. She also becomes caretaker for her ailing grandfather, Andrew, her only living relative, not counting her scoundrel father. But the gruff, deeply kind of kind Andrew has begun displaying signs of decline. This is a character-driven story. Um, it, you, there's lots of sadness at the beginning and um, she finds herself in this bad situation and then you just start to care about her and then you care about her father and then you care about the bookstore, which is definitely a character in this book. Um, I, I just really loved it. It was 12 hours long and came out a year ago in July, so it hasn't been out that long. It, I just highly recommend it. The second book I look, listened to was A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius by Dave Eggers. This had been on my shelf for years. Like literally, I had it as a hard copy for a while and it won a National Book Award. Um, I just didn't love it. It it was good. And I would really like to know if any of you read it and really, really loved it. Uh, it's a moving memoir of a college senior who in the space of five weeks loses both of his parents to cancer and inherits his eight-year-old brother. Here is an exhilarating debut that manages to be simultaneously hilarious. I will agree, there are parts that are really funny and wildly inventive, as well as deeply heartfelt story of a love that holds a family together. It is written kind of as a stream of consciousness, so that is how it's read, and it's um, very quick and uh, short thoughts that just come together one after another after another. I feel like that's kind of the way Dave Eggers' brain would work, and it gets to be emotionally a little... Um, exhausting, right? To listen to someone's brain who is just going a million miles an hour faster than your brain. But then there were some just really poignant parts. He tries really hard to raise this brother and does not do a great job of it all the way through. Um, but it, the story is very sad and I cannot recommend it to anyone who has known anyone who has died of cancer because the first few chapters are all about how his mother passed away and that, you know, that is really hard. It's important to know how hard that is to die of cancer and what it does to his life in context of the story, right? But if you have someone close to you or that has happened to you, it, I just can't imagine that you would want to read this. All in all, I would give it a thumbs up and it was good, but I felt like there were times where I was just like, oh my gosh, his brain is, he's, I think he's just a really smart guy. He's done a lot of really great things with his life um, and does a lot of giving back to community and worrying about our world and where things are, you know, food sustainability and um, poverty and um, crime. Uh, yeah, he's just really interesting. So I guess I don't, I never really rate the books. I, I would just say that I liked it. It was 14 hours long took me a lot longer to listen to than the first one. Is The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. Many of you will be well aware of this book um, because she has written a, you know, a number of excellent books. This came out in February, so it was hard to get. I've had it on hold on Libby for months and it finally came due. Um, it's 15 hours long and it is a story of the Great Depression era, uh, the Dust Bowl, uh, the hardships of a family during that time. Uh, I would call it a saga. <laughs> it does go on and on. But you follow this young woman, Elsa Wolcott, um, deemed too old to marry in a time when marriage is a woman's only option. The future seems bleak until the night she meets Rafe Martinelli and decides to change the direction of her life. With her reputation in ruin, there's only one respectable choice, marriage to a man she barely knows. And then by 1934, the world has changed. Millions are out of work and drought has devastated the Great Plains. 
and her husband is not necessarily in love with her. He was um, 18 when they get married, and then she lives with his family on this farm that can't make it. So um, a fascinating tale of, I was talking to Ross about it this weekend, Ross, my husband, for those of you that might not know his first name. Um, and I said, maybe I don't know enough about Hoover and that administration and what happened during that time because I felt like these people were really blaming um, the government and the banks and all that, yet it was the weather and some of the farming practices that caused much of that hardship you know, during that time. So I we talked about it quite a bit about how what you learn in school and what you think you know, and then you read something that kind of challenges that in little ways, right? Where you say, wow, I didn't realize the, the time frame around that, right? Like I just always think of 1929 as where it all happened, right? The Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl went on for years and years. So again, learning. <laughs> I always love to learn a little something and I would highly recommend if you can get your hands on on this book, The Four Winds. It was really well done. All right, I have a recipe for you all this week. I made this probably two weeks ago and I would say that it was very good. I follow the food nanny on Instagram. Um, she's a little loud and overzealous about her products, but I do feel like she is a bright spot in my day when she comes up in my feed, especially in my stories. She has a good attitude. She's very positive. I like to have people like that in my feed. And uh, she cooks. She's the one who uses uh, Kamut uh, bread, and I bought the flour from her and um, the dough hook. <laughs> And they sell finishing salt, and she's going to open a store in Utah. But this is an orzo salad, and we both really enjoyed it. So the dressing is olive oil, lemon juice, salt, and pepper. Just super easy, light, not like the dressings that we normally put in our salads at our house. Like we are Western Ranch, Thousand Island, <laughs> honey mustard people, and this is much lighter than that. And then you make three quarters of a cup of orzo pasta, which is just like a long, um, kind of bigger than rice. Um, and then you saute some chicken in olive oil and butter. And then you put in your, for your salad, you put three tablespoons of red onion, some dill, parsley, some tomatoes, some feta cheese, some toasted almonds, and then baby arugula is in with this and you pour the warm ozo, orzo over that arugula and um, I'll put a picture in. Uh, it was just very a light meal. I am still on my weight loss journey. Um, I am still doing intermittent fasting where I try not to eat until about one in the afternoon. Um, I'm a night owl so it's easier, harder for me not to eat at night and easy for me to not eat in the morning. Plus I stay up really late so I sleep late. So one o'clock is not that late. For some of you, that is halfway through the day, but for me, it's not. So I try not to eat till one o'clock, and I, I'm i trying. Um, I ate, I've been eating a little gluten. We've been out a couple times where I just couldn't make a choice to not have gluten, um, which is not great for me, but um, so I'll share. Um, I did no sugar, no gluten in May, and uh, I have been trying kind of on the bandwagon since February to try to lose weight. And I would say it took me a couple months to wrap my head around the fact that losing weight means eating less. <laughs> um, right? Like, yes, I'm going to do, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to exercise more and eat less. I'm going to do that. And then every night I would have this great plan. Tomorrow I'm going to do that. And I just didn't ever get on board. Like, I just was kind of eating more than I probably should have. Anyway. But really got on it. In, you know probably since April and so I'm down 11 pounds um, I'm at when I started I was at the highest weighted ever weighed in my life ever and gonna turn 60 at that point and was just really frustrated with my feet hurt my knees hurt my back hurts and uh, nothing fits but I've always been full figured um, and so I'm, I'm really pleased because I do think it will help my feet and my knees to have less weight on. But 
Losing the 11 pounds put me at the second highest weight I'd ever been at in my entire life goal when I was on the scale. I'm like, well, okay, now I'm, I'm back down to the number that I never wanted to be at at one point in time. So this was a very light meal. It was, you know, chicken and salad with a little orzo in it. Um, we don't eat a lot of orzo, so it was kind of something new and interesting, kind of fun. Anyway, so there's your recipe of the week. I do want to say that I did put out a podcast between uh, the last podcast and this one, and it was my favorite books. So that actually went live last week on Monday, um, late Monday night. I had finally got it edited, and I'm getting a lot of really good feedback from a lot of you. So if you don't, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, you would not have seen that that went live. Um, so you have to hit that subscribe button so that if I put out extra content, you would get a little, it would come up when you opened your YouTube, it would show you that I had a new podcast as opposed to now you just hearing about it a week later. Uh, so I did my 18 favorite books of all time or the books that stuck with me. I, I don't really think, and I asked some of my knitting friends on Thursday, you know, come up with a favorite, right? Like you. It's really hard to come up with a favorite. I could come up with, with favorites in each category. So that's kind of what I did. Um, and I shared those and that it, it's been really fun. My brother watched and then he went out in the comments and said, since many of you are sharing some of yours, here are some of mine. So my brother is Jeff Schmidt and he has a comment under that video with some of his favorite books of all time. So thanks for that, Jeff. Um, he was really interested in the chocolate war and, um, and said maybe he'll put some of the, couple of the romance off until later. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's an avid reader. He's even a bigger reader, book reader than I am. He, he loves reading like my father. Um, so I did put that out. Um, at the end, I have like some of my favorite authors, um, some favorite series of all time, some favorite YA books of all time. Sorry about that. I had to edit. My husband came in, was carrying a big box of tools, clanking all over. So a little, a little edit there. But go out and watch that podcast if you have a chance and you like to read. Maybe I'll give you a few books on your shelf that you might like to try or put on your to be read list. I've got lists and lists, but some of you are sharing your favorite books or books that you recommend to me. And it's funny because once you say them, then I say, oh, I read that too and I did like that, right? Then books come back to you. But when you have to go back over, you know, 40 years of your reading life, even longer, 50 years of my reading life, um, it, it was just a lot to try to narrow it down and come and keep it condensed. I tried really hard to not go on and on about the books and just tell a little brief snippet of each one so that you could go through it pretty quickly. So go take a look at that. Um, always remember to like and subscribe um, to your favorite YouTube podcasts. I have one little tip this week. I, in the last year, she talked about a shawl on the podcast called Raven Thule. It was the Northern Lights, and it was a yarn dyer that dyed the yarn that striped in the shawl. It was gray with really dark rainbow. I'll put a picture in, and um, she is going to re-dye that colorway, and she hasn't dyed it for a while, and so I thought some of you might be interested. It's the Concrete and Tulips, and it's by Gage Dye Works, and it is a rainbow striped with dark gray in between. So it's really moody and was super fun to knit because the yarn striped in the shawl. So it's like a self-striping sock yarn for a shawl. So she figured out the percentages and the amount that you need to knit the shawl in order to make it kind of gradiate into those colors. So I wanted to share that with you because probably in the last mm, five days, she has said that she's going to re-dye that yarn um, on Instagram. And so I'm sure that it's gonna be up in her shop and that people who follow her would be able to get a skein of that. But I know that it wasn't available for a long time and some of you may have wanted to um, look into that. So Gage Dye Works. The sweater of the week this week is called Lane Way by Vera Valamaki. And I started knitting this in 2018 and then it was crumpled in a bag. <laughs> not getting done, not getting finished, and it was a big piece, right? Like there were lots of colorways here. 
Um, it came out in 2014 and it is knit on a two and a four. It is fingering weight yarn. Laneway is a strikingly graphic tunic. It feels like a light breath on your skin, but keeps you wonderfully warm and cozy, softness at its best. And if you look closely, you can find a little splash of color in this otherwise monochromatic design. Interpretations is the first design collaboration between Hohi Locatelli and Vera Valamaki, a magical collection featuring 12 patterns. So it came out in the interpretations book. Um, I didn't start it until uh, four years later after I saw some of the bright graphic um, ones that at ZK one year, uh, Katie DB 13, is that her Instagram? Anyway, she wore a super bright one. I'm like, oh, I have to have that. And then Tannis came out with the colorway kit. And I was like, oh, then I wouldn't have to come up with the striping myself. Maybe I should just buy the kit. So I did, I bought the kit. Um, from Tannis Fiber Arts. The kit was called the Blue Sand, for the Blue Sands Cardigan, and I decided to use it for the laneway and wanted to try to go through the colorways multiple times. And as you know, the bottom of the tunic gets larger and larger, so it gets bigger over here. I've actually never worn this to anything, um, but I had my uh, sample knitter Jane help me out last fall, end of last fall, um, when my thumbs were tied up and I was sitting around not knitting but going through projects and trying to figure out what I could have help with to get things finished up so that I could open up my headspace to design more and not have all these whips hanging around. So this is one of them. And uh, it, I, I think it got finished in... January sometime um, and then I haven't been anywhere to actually wear it so it's been kind of folded up that's just a line from my the fold in my mannequin is right there so that's what that line is um, but anyway it you can make it you know long sleeve short sleeve three-quarter length sleeved uh, there are a number of sizes it goes from extra small to x to x large which is a 38 inch bust to a 50 inch bust uh, it was originally knit with the uncommon thread uh, merino cashmere nylon and she did it in like a two-tone color just two versions so if you've got fingering weight uh, yarn that you love like the contrast color then you could just pick a neutral and and make this and you could make it shorter long it is asymmetrical at the bottom it does kind of go up and down um, on the, the corners because you've got this um, these two rows here so this side gets longer uh, but yeah, I think it's it's just a lovely rainbow piece. So wanted to share that today. That's the sweater of the week. On my uh, live Zoom that I did from up north at the lake with uh, Down Cellar Studios and the Summer Splash Pad Party Knit Along, which you can still join at any time if you need some motivation to knit something and you wanna get points and prizes, <laughs> go out to the Splash Pad Party uh, thread in Ravelry or to go over to Down Cellar Studio Boston Jen on Instagram and take a look at the Splash Bed Party. But when I decided to become a sponsor, I got to do that one hour live where they invited people for the weekend and I was up at the lake and I shared my upcoming designs and one of the designs that I shared with everyone was the rhubarb ball scarf and it came out last Thursday with Stephen B and Madeline Tosh. Now, it was a bit of a surprise to me that it was in the newsletter last Thursday because I didn't think it was going to come out until today or tomorrow when the, when the podcast goes live, but they featured it last Thursday, so I did a quick scramble. The pattern was ready. I, we were waiting for the yarn to come in because it takes three skeins of fingering weight. You can use whatever yarn you have in your stash, but Stephen B. kitted up the colorways for this scarf and so I use the rhubarb colorway which is this one here in the middle which is glorious like it is orange and lime and lavender and pinks and reds it's it's just I think it's the prettiest colorway Malintosh has done and I love their tart which is the other this color and then that is the grasshopper over there or lettuce you can use either one they're they're 
fairly similar. One's a little more limey, but um, so Stephen B ordered in kits, and then Stephen chose two other colorway kits that you can you can choose from, and they sent those out in their newsletter. So one of them is a blue and purple, which everyone loves blues and purples, and it's called Spectrum. So there are kind of two tonal colorways and then kind of a variegated. And then the other one is called Blah Blah, and that's a black and gray with a speckle pink and yellow in the middle, white speckle in the middle, which is lovely pop of color. And so uh, there are kits available on Stephen B's website. You can go to, um, his website, Stephen B Studios, and then you go to shop, and then you go to kits, and it is listed there. Um, but I also have a link um, in the newsletter that I sent out for those of you that are on my newsletter list. You might have a newsletter sitting in your inbox. Um, it might be over in your social or your promotions, depending on where it goes, but I did send out a coupon code for people who were on my newsletter uh, last Thursday. And then uh, this is simple to knit. This is TV knitting. This is stockinette on the bias. You go back and forth, increase on one end, decrease on the other end. Um, it's got like a little bit of an I-cord slip stitch edging so it doesn't roll too much. And then there are some stripes when you first start. So you start with one color. I think I started with a green and then did uh, the rhubarb colored stripes then knit all the green and then did some rhubarb colorway and then did some stripes down here of the green of the rhubarb colorway again. And then I added the felted balls, which just makes the whole thing, if you ask me. <laughs> I found a vendor on Etsy who has all the colors of the felted balls. So you don't have to make them and you can just go over and buy them from her. The vendor is called Wool Jamboree on Etsy, and she's out of Marinette, Wisconsin, and she has all the different colorways. So she's got, you can buy all the reds, you can buy all the greens, you can, you can mix and match, you can pick the ones you want, you can get the size you want, you can get small or medium. And I just picked, I laid out the rhubarb colorway, the rhubarb colorway and I just picked all the colors that were in the rhubarb colorway, and then I just hung them on the bottom of the, sharp, of the scarf. This is how they go. They're just sewn on there, on the bottom. <laughs> really fun. It gives it some weight and it makes it, um, it stays on your shoulders. So I called it a scarf, but it could be a shawl because it's this wide. So you can wrap it around your shoulders if you get, you know, chilled. So it hangs nicely around my shoulders or you can wrap it around your neck. And this is the way I was thinking a lot of people would wear it, is just shoved through here when you go out in the winter time, you know, and you do this and the, the balls are hanging down. But look at this lovely colorway. You see how fun that is? Yeah, it was just really fun, really fun to knit. But if you don't like felted balls on the bottom of your rhubarb scarf, you can do t uh, little minis, little mini pom-poms. So I made hundreds of little mini pom-poms with a fork. Well, not hundreds. Okay, I'm always prone to exaggeration, right? So just took a fork and wrapped it around, tied them off. They did not take time, much time at all. Um, and I just made little mini pom-poms. I also sewed those on the bottom of the scarf and took a picture. Or you would also have the option to do a tassel. So you could put a tassel on this corner and a tassel on this corner hanging down to give the ends of the shawl some weight. 
That is my favorite thing about a long shawl, is when it has some weight on the end, either beads or something like this, where it makes it more wearable because it stays put, because it's not this light, airy, ethere ethereal, <laughs> inside, inside joke um, uh, on that one, right? It's just so much fun. So you just have your little bit of stripe, and then you go across, back and forth in stockinette, if you're at knitting group, this is the perfect thing to carry with you all summer long. Just back and forth, super fun. You could do all kinds of colors to make it make it fun. You could stripe the whole thing if you if you wanted to. You could just go back and forth, striping every two rows. You could do it in nautical colors. Um, you, you could, but I just love the rhubarb colorway. Now, I also love rhubarb. And I have a rhubarb plant in my backyard that I harvest from most of the summer. And when I lived in Virginia, I told a little story at the beginning of the pattern that my dad had to ship me a rhubarb plant because I could not find a rhubarb plant in Virginia to grow rhubarb when we were out there. And the reason that I like rhubarb is because I like rhubarb cake. <laughs> I do like rhubarb kuchen or rhubarb pie, but I really like this uh, rhubarb cake with broiled topping and so two or three times a year I make this rhubarb cake so I included the recipe in the pattern so when you go to Ravelry and you purchase the pattern or if you buy a kit you get the pattern with the kit they purchased patterns so if you buy the kit the price is in there already so you don't have to go pick it out yourself um, but you would get it in your Ravelry it would come up that you would have the pattern and then the recipe is right there because I just thought I've had recipes in pattern books before and I love to cook and share and the the caramel broiled topping on the top of this cake it has coconut even if you don't like coconut it broils it in caramel so it it is delicious you you spread it over the top and then you put it um on your under your broiler for about four minutes and it bubbles it's kind of coffee cake like but moist because it has sour cream in it um oh, <laughs> i should make some this week the problem with it is that i want to eat a couple pieces and then there's a whole cake there so you have to take some to your neighbors take some to a friend right because it's a 9 by 13 pan of rhubarb cake and uh, i that's why i have a rhubarb plant <laughs> so this is called rhubarb balls scarf Stephen B. and his staff thought that it would be a cute play on words to have balls in there. Um, and you can use any three colors that you like, uh, but the kits are really fun. So you, if you want a kit, you could go over to Stephen B. and purchase a kit. That, that would be really nice for me, too, because that would support the collaboration that I did with Stephen B. and Madeline Tosh Yarns. Madeline Tosh Yarns was bought by Jimmy Beans Wool, and so there for a while... Uh, they were switching things over and it was taking a little bit longer to get custom orders but they did custom orders for me and I got several skeins of the rhubarb colorway and um, for myself they're right in here um, and I, I'm gonna say it took maybe four or five weeks for my three skeins of the rhubarb colorway to come to me because I just wanted to have some more of my stash since we used this one up I love the drape of fingering weight. Um, you could definitely make it shorter. You could make it wider. That would be, and that would make it shorter. Just, you know, cast on a few more stitches. Like I said, this is easy peasy knitting. Pick your favorite color and cast on and you'll have a scarf for fall and winter to wear. You can wrap it around your neck when you have your coat on. And then when you get in somewhere, you can put it around your shoulders and uh, keep yourself warm. I just think it's super fun. And I love that Wool Jamboree did all of the fun, <laughs> the fun balls for those to be sewn on there. And I just sewed them on with thread. I just went all the way through the ball and came back out. So there's a little divot in the end, you can see there. So it didn't take, didn't take long. I just laid them, they, I literally laid them side by side by side and just sewed the next one on. Um, I mean, it took a little while. It wasn't like a five-minute job. I, I sat and talked to Amber 
um, one day and said, okay, I'm going to get these all sewn on, and I only got one end done. Um, just an update on Amber, who will probably not be podcasting um, this summer. She was going to podcast earlier, but um, she's back in school. Amber went back to school for the summer because the principal in her town um, asked her if she would be interested in substitute teaching, and she has shared online that she is back to school, but if you're, if you're not on Instagram, you might not know that, and she's taking four classes to finish, <laughs> and so she is writing papers and studying and re history, all, all the history, and so uh, morning until night. I, I hadn't talked to her in a week or two, um, in person and I finally said how are you doing are you underwater can we chat for a few minutes I just need to know that you're alive and she loves learning she's kind of like me so it isn't uh, it's a big deal when you haven't been in school for a while but to go back and finish up I'm um, taking some classes so that's what she's thinking about doing so she's super busy so I know a lot of you text her and or email or reach out via DM or whatever, and you say to me, when will Amber podcast next? And it just seems like she's in this cycle of life where things are just causing her to be busy. They were busy with their jobs for a while and then their company um, as far as like COVID and that was crazy. And then, you know, it, it's just, yeah, she's just in a time of life where she's super busy and doing some things and it's really hard to fit podcasting in. If you are unaware, <laughs> Podcasting is a big job to do. I mean, it just takes a lot of planning, what you want to talk about, organizing what you're going to say, uh, setting it up, editing it and taking it down. And it's very easy to talk yourself out of doing it, <laughs> which I did for many years. Like I, you know, I'm going to podcast it. And I never did. I never did it for many years because it, it's daunting to think about. And then when I decided to do it, I said to myself, you will do it on a schedule because it will be so easy for you to say, I'm not going to do it this week, right? So if you have podcasters out there that are podcasting regularly and putting out free content for you, make sure you're thanking those folks because it takes a lot. And I'm not complaining. Last week I said I'm super busy and then several of you reached out and said, you know, you had a question for me or whatever and you said, I know you're really busy. I'm not that busy. Like, <laughs> I'm not too busy. Let's put it that way. I'm choosing this, right? I'm choosing the design thing. I'm choosing to, to do the podcasting. I'm, there are no complaints in that part of that. Like, I'm busy. I'm not complaining about that. If I did not take on all of the stuff that I'm doing right now, I would be divorced. <laughs> because I am not pleasant to live with when I'm home and not around people and not surrounded by things that I love and talking to my friends and going out and about. And so I, I took on the extra work and took on the, you know, extra podcast, putting in a bonus episodes and doing, you know, content like that because it fills me up. I am busy, maybe too busy, maybe not gonna get everything done, but it isn't a bad thing, so please don't feel sorry for me. Or And I all often am self-deprecating on the podcast. I will say something about my glasses or my hair or whatever, but I'm also not super serious, right? Like, about it. Some of you are like, oh, Corey, you're, you're a nice, you know, don't worry. And I'm like, oh, no, I have, it, my self-esteem is intact, <laughs> right? Like, after 60 years, if you don't love who you are at that point, you, you got to figure it out, right? Because, <laughs> right? like, whatever, I am who I am. And I just put it out there, and I love all you, and, and there's no judgment here. I'm not going to judge people and, and be, I really don't want to be gossipy. I don't want to talk about other people and their stuff, right? It's just not of importance to me. I have my own set of stuff going on here. And yes, I, can I get down? Absolutely. And can I be, you know, mad at myself or whatever, but not, I'm just being self-deprecating. So no worries to those of you who are very kind, empathetic souls who are like worried about me. It's okay. Um, it's all good. The people from Max Carpet Bags did reach out to me and thank me. <laughs> I did send them a note just saying, hey, I just wanted you to know that I had shouted you out on the podcast. 
Um, and they gave me a little coupon code. Um, I think it's just for me to use because I had said I hadn't purchased one yet, but that I was waiting to see if they would have something in a brighter fabric like an orange. I love the red one, but and he said he will look at the market to see if they can find something with oranges in it. <laughs> so um, for all of you that got carpet bags, um, I hope that some of you are carrying them proudly and loving them. I know it wasn't just the carpet bags. Some of you got purses, crossbodies, little wallets. Some of you got like more of a, a project bag, not the carpet bag, not the giant one, but that was Etsy to max carpet bags. And I did not purchase that, did not know about the quality, but then people got in touch and said that the quality was excellent on those. And they have been in business for a long time. Um, he did tell me that in the message that he sent me. This is what it said. This is Park from MCW Carpet Bag. I'm sorry for not replying earlier. We are working on the Carpet Bag's monogram project and there were, there were much back and forth with embroidery and carpet factories. Thank you so much for the delightful message. And it's really encouraging. Your videos are awesome. You're very dedicated and professional. Not sure about that. Uh, the description was accurate. I can see you did a lot of work. In fact, we're a family business and have been manufacturing for over 25 years. Started with leather bags in 1990s, and since three years ago, we began to focus on carpet bags. Thank you for the information. I told him that his bags would be great for knitters, and he could go to knitting conventions and you know stitches or Vogue because people would go crazy for those carpet bags. And he said, we're very interested. I will talk with my team and probably we could make a section for knitting organizer bags with technical and structural improvements based on current designs as the yarn tools and the patterns need specific storage space and protection which I thought was great right that he was um, telling me that and then we look forward to more comments in your channel thank you for supporting our family business um, they did give me a coupon code um, and then I will work on orange tone patterns with our carpet supplier and we'll keep you informed. So that, I mean, that just really made my, made me happy that they saw an uptick <laughs> that several of you purchased bags. And um, so, yeah, I just thought I should share that bit too. Okay. Uh, the last thing that I want to share is uh, that the, I put a post up on Instagram about the Trevor Project hat that I was donating money to the Trevor Project for um, LGBTQ youth who um, are going through depression, suicidal thoughts, and how that organization helps. And at the time I put the pattern out, I put the cowl pattern, the matching cowl pattern in, but I didn't have it knit up because I needed to wait for another skein of yarn from Sarah. And so I thought I should just at least show you that I did knit a coordinating cowl and it is just a regular, uh, you know, round cowl, but I did add the band at the bottom. I thought it'd be kind of fun to add um, that I-cord band and put a coordinating button on. So I put a small button on the hat and then I put a larger coordinating button on the cowl, but both of those patterns are in the pattern. So if you purchased for $10 so that your donation would go to the Trevor Project, or if you wanna use either one of the discount codes, those are on the Ravelry page. I got my matching buttons from the Magpie's Eye on Etsy, and they came from the UK. So they took a while to get here. Um, but I ordered the large and the small rainbow glitter button and they match you know perfectly the magpie's eye is where i got my matching buttons for the cowl and the hat and i am donating so far um we rounded up a bit but i donated 500 dollars to the trevor project um i did not have as good a sales on the hat as i would have liked I don't know if people just don't want to knit hats this time of year or if it actually has to do with pride and the fact that I'm donating money to LGBTQ. But I care about kids. I care about LGBTQ youth. Um, and so I was really hoping to donate more. I, my goal was $1,000. So if you are so inclined and you would like to go out and purchase that pattern, I'm still 
100% of what I make, so that's minus the PayPal and Etsy fees um, that I take out, um, will go to the Trevor Project. It's Father's Day today. And I know not all of you have fathers still in your lives or maybe never had a father in your life, but I did. And so I was gonna just have my Corey story be about my dad today. I don't think that the podcast has ever fallen on Father's Day. Um, it happens to be Sunday afternoon here when I'm recording because I have some things to do tomorrow. And so I'll just have time to edit and get it up. So I am recording a day early, but my dad was a pharmacist. So um, that's how he and my mother met. She was a soda jerk and my dad was a pharmacist and she was 18 and dad was like 23 or 24 um, when they met at the pharmacy where my dad was doing his internship. Not sure that that's what they called it then. Um, and he asked my mom on a date. I was shocked that my grandpa would let her go with a man that old at that time. Um, but they have been madly in love ever since and my dad worked harder than most dads I know to support our family. So he and my mom had a small drugstore in Condi, South Dakota for, for the first five years of my life. Um, I was born about a year after my parents were married. Uh, and so I grew up in, for the first like five years of my life in this small town where my dad owned the local town drugstore. And then they sold the drugstore and moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where my dad bought a corner drugstore that had a soda fountain and um, a little post office and a liquor department and a cards and gifts, um, kind of like the full service little corner grocery or corner pharmacy. Um, but he went to work at nine in the morning and came home at 10 at night. Those were his hours. He would come home between 5.30 and 6.30 most nights to eat dinner and he worked Monday through Saturday, nine to 10, and then Sundays, nine to one, he was open. And so I saw my dad an hour a day, and we needed to be home at supper time at 5.30 in order to see our dad. And as I got older, one night a week, he had a substitute pharmacist come in so that my dad could go bowl and actually do have an activity. Um, but that's a lot of hours. And he stood for all those hours filling prescriptions. The counter at the drugstore was high, which they are in most pharmace pharmacies, if you've ever looked, which many of you probably have never looked, but they have a, a fairly high countertop so that they can count pills. And when you're a pharmacist, you can't make a mistake, right? That is a profession, like a few other professions in the world, where you cannot make a mistake. If you fill the wrong prescription, if you give too much medication, the consequences are, right, deadly. And my dad never made a mistake in, in all those years. He just, he never, you have to be so on and so careful and so double checking and standing at that counter. And I think to myself, there are days when he must have just been too tired to go back to work at 6.30 at night. Yet he did. Which, you know when you're a young kid, <laughs> you don't appreciate that. But we had a delivery boy back in the day and we kids had to carry pop up from the basement, bottled pop, that's the way it was sold. Six pack of bottles, we sold lots of pop, lots of candy, um, you know, but he carried everything. He had a little home section where there would be sometimes some towels or a scale or uh, an alarm clock. There, there were, if we had a comic book section and magazines and books, he sold all that stuff. And I worked there from the time I could reach the cash register until I went to college. And I just was thinking today about the man that my father was because I hear my husband complain. I hear myself complain. I know we complained around Kylie. I know that there were times when we would sit down to dinner and dad would say, I had a really tough day at work today, or I would say, you know, whatever. I don't ever remember that from my father. 
He probably complained to my mom at times, right? But I don't remember hearing that. I don't remember hearing my dad say, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I don't really want to go back to work, I'd rather stay home with you and the kids or whatever. Like, he made that choice and then he just did it. And that memory, I called my dad today <laughs> and I got a little choked up um, because I was said, I hope you have time for a nap and I hope you're reading and he, I sent him a gift card for some books. And um, I said, did you get my card? And he said, yeah, it came yesterday and I've already got it downloaded so I can buy some books. He's an avid, avid reader. And that's where that comes from. My mom is not a reader. My mom can't stand to read. Uh, my mom does not enjoy reading. And it's kind of a funny thing because my dad and I and Jeff, we all love reading so much. But I was talking to him and I got on Instagram afterwards. We were coming home and Ross had to stop at the parts store, um, which is a regular occurrence on our way to and from anywhere on any given day because he needed some tubing. So I was sitting in the car, I was on Instagram, and this song came up by this young gal who competed on American Idol, I think, in the last few years. Her name is Jax, J-A-X, and she is under Instagram as Jax Writes Songs, and she's got a really quirky voice, which I like, but um, she writes kind of funny ditties, and I follow her because she makes me laugh. Um, she also uh, often does like a spoof on something, but she wrote this song about her parents and she wrote about how she needs a man when she grows up who loves her the way her dad loves her mom. <laughs> oh my goodness, you'll just cry. So I posted it on my Facebook today for my father because I found a man who loves me the way my dad loves my mom, but my dad loves my mom and my mom loves my dad. And I was so fortunate, and I think you forget sometimes how fortunate you are to have two parents that can be together for 62, you know, 61 years. Um, yeah, next week, my mom and dad, oh my gosh, okay, so I turned 60 in April, which means mom and dad, 61 this month. <laughs> um, anyway, it just, I thought, I, I don't want to make people who don't have those loving relationships sad. But I do want to honor the fact that I had one. And it makes me happy and proud and feel all the loves <laughs> on days like this. So, um, yeah, I just thought I would share how much I love my dad um, and, my, and my family. The fact that I had a family that, you know, got to do a lot of things. I would say we grew up, you know, uh, able to do the things that we wanted to do, but we were not wallowing in money, right? Like there was not just like extra money for things all the time. Um, and that was wonderful because then you grow up with a sense of the importance of what you have, right? Being fortunate and being blessed. So yeah, I'm not trying to be all downer today, um, but I just thought, I didn't have a funny Corey stories in the last two weeks. I am seeing a new fibromyalgia PT, and I've seen her twice, and she's wonderful. She's kind of a cross between a massage therapist and a chiropractor. She's a physical therapist who deals a lot with people with chronic pain. And... Um, She's worked on me twice now where I just kind of lay on this table and she does really slow pressure and movement and just stretching and um, I'm really hoping <laughs> that it can help because um, I've been so fatigued lately. <laughs> I'm just tired all the time, sleeping all the time and everything hurts. So um, I just said, you know, I gotta, I gotta try to see someone and see and then I got a referral from a neighbor friend. Uh, who said you should you should try this gal so I'm driving to see her every Thursday afternoon once a week she does um, things really slow and I appreciate that because when you have fibromyalgia um, and you go to a massage therapist it feels so good for them to get in there and like get all the just work it and you go to the chiropractor and they adjust you and you're like yes but you hurt for days afterwards right like it it just can set off this uh, high alert to your nerves 
And she doesn't do that. She said, it might feel like I'm not doing a lot. But then I sit up from the table and my head feels lighter and my body kind of cracks and I can move and I think, oh, okay, yes, no, it didn't feel like she did a lot, but oh, I feel so much better. So I'm hoping that I can, you know, continue on with her and with that and kind of uh, work through some of this, you know, weight loss, a little more exercise. I'm going to the gym and I'm riding the bicycle, the recumbent bicycle, listening to my audiobook every other day. I don't like to go to the gym. I like to walk outside with my dog. And he's so sad <laughs> when I leave because he knows I'm getting in the car. I don't go that many places and um, right now still. And I get in the car and he's sitting there like, you could take me to the dog park. I'm like, we're not going to the dog park today, bud. So I've been walking every other day to try to give my foot a break. And I went back to line dancing. So a week ago Friday, I went back to line dancing, strapped on my big Claude Hopper shoe with the big sole, and I made it a half an hour. And then I thought to myself, it hurts. And I can't hurt it, but how much pain do I want to be in later? So I left after half an hour, and then I emailed the teacher and said, hey, I think I can do this. Like, I think I could sit, I could make it through part of class. Oh, I love line dancing. <laughs> It just makes me feel like I'm moving and happy music. Oh, people, there's only like six ladies and we're in a big giant gym, but they have boxes on the floor for us to stay in our space. Um, hi, did you hear me say your name? But this week I went and I did about 50 minutes. We started late and we didn't do, as the songs weren't as fast, so I could manage a little better. When we do a fast song, then I have to move more and then I'm on my foot more. And so I paid for the session. And so I'm tickled because I used to go twice a week and I haven't, you know, I haven't been back since my foot surgery in November. So yeah, you know, trying to take care of things around here. I have a couple new designs coming out. The plaid pillow is coming. That should be out in the next two weeks um, to match the plaid blanket. So I'm excited about getting that done. I'm going to do a new sock collection this fall. I have a hat coming out that's super fun and interesting. Um, and yeah, and I'm going to do an advent. Uh, so if you haven't watched that live Zoom from when I was up at the lake, I shared on that um, all the things uh, that I'm doing. And if you're a spinner uh, or you like fiber... Uh, I'm going to do an advent for that, uh, for people who like to spin. Uh, so that, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm busy. I'm keeping one foot in front of the other. I always have something that I have to be working on at night. I got that cowl knit up in the last day. That cowl, I just knit, 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 knit to get that um, done once that yarn came in because she had so many pre-orders for that Trevor Project yarn um, that she got behind. And she had a problem at her shop. She was closed for two days. I don't know if it was water or electricity. And I didn't ask her in the email. I should have because I wondered. But she had a, I had to shut down the shop and situation. And I thought, oh, that's gotta be so hard, right? When you are a yarn dyer and you have orders to get out and then you have a problem in your building. Oh gosh, it's gotta be. Um, really hard but go over to Stephen B and check out that uh, those kits the rhubarb ball scarf um, go buy the pattern uh, on Ravelry it's available for six dollars go buy the Trevor Project um, hat if you um, are so inclined I would really like to donate a bit more money to that and it it really made me sad that the hat wasn't as well received as I thought it might be I thought the squiggly pom-pom and the bright colors might be kind of might be kind of fun for people but anyway, um, let's do the hellos. Hello to Charlene Richards, Valerie Fisher, Nikki Leffler, Danielle Brown, Crochet Creations by Christy, Teresa Klopel, Brenda Mellan, Pat Kohler, Marianne Stoner, Timberly Weitzel, who won the prize last time, and I did get your address, Timberly, and mailed that out. Uh, George Ann Braden, Susan Wright, Trudy Schwartz, Burrell, Regina Seeger, Diana Barnes, Karen H., Margarita Deverson, Melanie Cahoon, Stephanie Haberman, Kate Wilson, Pat Howes, Christine Carr, Angela Jenkins, Terry Monk, Judy Fick, Linda Lepic, Kathy B., Luanna Hendricks, 
Kathy Evans, Linda Rose, Christy Lakaitis, Brandy Stoker, Debbie McKenzie, Janet Robertson, Peggy Bork, Heather Wilson, Kath Karen Tumblin, Cheryl Lacemaker, Dil Dilelli, Kathy Goodman, Candy Harris, Rocky Mountain Penny, Barbara Birch, who remembers Dayton's. We talked about Dayton's on the last podcast, and she said, oh, I remember Dayton so well, the department store downtown. It was such a beautiful store. Uh, hello to Glenda Bathgate and Jessen, Just Make a Knit. So thank you all for chiming in, leaving me a comment, or just saying something um, to make my day. It really helps. Uh, you can always buy me a coffee if you appreciate the content that I'm putting out, and that is at www.kofi.com. And uh, you can buy me a Diet Coke, which I'm out of right now. So I need one. <laughs> because I get so dry. Um, but until next time, no green bananas. Keep it colorful. Hang on to your fork. I love you all. Big hug. We're coming out of it on the other side here of this darn quarantine and being in lockdown. I think of a lot of you daily. So don't complain with your mouth full like I want to do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never regret ripping back. Bye.